Hello, welcome everyone. Uh, we're happy to have you joining us today and appreciate you taking time from your busy schedules. Uh, my name's Kimberly, I'm part of the QGIVE team. Uh, if you haven't um, worked with us before, we're an online fundra uh, fundraising platform and we're dedicated to helping nonprofits raise more money. And part of how we do that is through webinars like this one. Um, today's webinar will be just about 45 minutes with a Q&A session that follows, and that'll keep our total time together to just about an hour. Um, we are recording the presentation, and we will be sending um, each of you a follow-up email, which will include a recording, a copy of the presentation, as well as um, links to all of the resources we discuss. So please do look um, for that email in your inbox in the next day or so. Um, if you do have questions at any point during the presentation, uh, go ahead, pop them into the questions box, and our presenter is ready to answer and discuss these during our Q&A portion that's following uh, the presentation. Um, after today's webinar, please make sure to respond to our survey. Um, your feedback is crucial in determining future content for webinars and other resources uh, that we develop throughout the year. Um, QGIVE knows the value of relationships, and we're very proud to connect uh, our nonprofits to our partner network. And we hope this helps increase our nonprofit friends' effectiveness, success. Uh, today, and we're excited to introduce you to Brightbridge Nonprofit Solutions. Um, they recently transitioned over from CharityNet USA brand, uh, and we've been partnering with them since 2019. Uh, Brightbridge focuses on helping nonprofits start grow and maintain their compliance, whereas QGIVE um, focuses on comprehensive fundraising solutions, uh, including year-round fundraising tools like donation forms, text giving, peer-to-peer -peer fundraising, event management, auctions, events, more. Um, so together, though, we enjoy helping nonprofits and organizations like yours and make smart and strategic digital fundraising decisions. So without further ado, I would like to introduce our speaker today, Andrea Ortega, Director of Nonprofit Services at Brightbridge. And as you'll hear, Andrea brings great subject matter expertise to today's understanding compliance fundraising topic. Over to you, Andrea. Hi, everyone. My name's Andrea. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Um, hopefully we're good there and you all can see it. Um, so understanding nonprofit compliance and fundraising, and that's something that I'm extremely passionate about compliance. And as someone who ran their own nonprofit for eight years, I understand the importance on fundraising. And sometimes we don't really see the relationship because we're too busy, you know, trying to help the community. And I really wanted to come together with my something I'm really passionate about and something that you as a nonprofit leader really needs to understand. Um, so let's go ahead and get started. All right, so Brightbridge, we essentially, we're a one-stop shop for all things nonprofit. We guarantee 501c3 for anybody who comes to us with their ideas and their dreams. Uh, we do have other services to help grow and develop your nonprofit, such as web design, graphic design. We help with submit with grants, gear up for grants, uh, different things that we think you're going to need to successfully run your nonprofit. Uh, of course, your 990s and tax returns, and that's something that I'm extremely passionate about. We're going to talk about that transparency. Um, again, because I ran my own nonprofit, I remember and it was a little bit from that startup new found uh, new board phase. I remember all of these administrative things that blew my mind. I was pretty good at having others join the mission. I was pretty good at, you know, volunteering and developing programs. But when I was hit with that role of that administrative uh, background, it was, you know, I had to sort of be self-taught and, and, and learn it. So I'm just so excited to share that knowledge with you uh, because as a nonprofit leader, you really want to focus on what you're good at, which is that program development and volunteer management or, sh or sharing that voice, you know. So Brightbridge, we're kind of that administrative partner that can help you on the back end. 
Um, so what to expect today, this webinar is for you, the nonprofit leaders, dreamers, or anyone who's in the nonprofit sector. Um, you might know some of the things, you might have never put the relationship together, or maybe this is right up in your alley, but I think understanding from a tax preparer, as well as someone who's been in the field will really help you connect those things so that you can take them back and implement them. Uh, no matter where you are in the journey, I try to merge the two topics and regardless of your understanding, um, I think these are the good things that you're going to be able to take to your team um, and it'll ultimately better your organization. So we're going to talk about this webinar. I designed it to why is this important? I want you to, again, understand the relationship and be able to use it as you share this knowledge with the rest of, of the people in your nonprofit. Uh, we'll move into bookkeeping and make strong organizations. So we'll talk about that transparency and donor trust. Uh, and then moving on to federal compliance and fundraising. So we've talked about the IRS, maybe you're familiar with 990s, those tax preparations that by the way are due May 15th, if your organization's fiscal year ends in December. Then we'll talk about state compliance. What? Uh, they're, they're two separate things and most people don't know that or it's a little bit hard to capture that even though you have the IRS uh, nonprofit status, you still need to keep that updated with your state. And then, of course, we'll end with some questions where I hope that uh, what I'm saying, not only are you able to understand that, but that it it captures something in you to, to go even further with your fundraising um, and your donor relations. So why is this important, right? We talk about transparency and how that equals um, uh, donor trust. Donor trust can help develop those long-term relationship with your donors. Um, in an ideal world, an organization's revenue, and this might look different if you are someone that's very uh, staff heavy, uh, right? Most of your programs are ran by maybe you help people with disabilities. So the bulk of your, of your expenses are in the salaries you pay for therapists. But in an ideal world, you know, we're talking about grassroots organizations, 60 to 70% should be individual contributions. The rest are divided between private and grant funding, and of course, uh, corporate and government funding. But 60 60 to 70% should come from that donor base. Those are your recurring donors, uh, the people you gather from social media campaigns, maybe from people who attend your annual events and annual galas and people who do decide to donate 10, 10 dollars a month to your organization. But those individual contributions um, are really the strength of, of fundraising. You know, of course you have your events and things like that, but 60 to 70%. Um, so we should put importance in transparency to our donors, right? So according to give.org report on donor trust, I highly recommend you read it. They've been collecting data for a long time now. Individuals will place high importance in trust are more than likely to donate to charities and contribute more money. So the more, that means the more you're transparent, the more you build that relationship through don and obtain that donor trust, the more than likely they're going to contribute money and not just recurring, but when you do make your campaign or your year to end campaign about reaching a goal, they're, they already trust you. So they're going to be more than likely to give to you. Uh, we find there is a study also done um, back uh, in a couple a couple years back in the University of Tennessee in 2014, and they found that a nonprofit is going to allow to give you more audited financial statements if it has uh, larger contribution data. So what they kind of found in this study was that organizations were more transparent because they've been also uh, operating with good, you know, larger contribution. And then uh, I, th I thought it was interesting that organizations who tend to lobby more or have more different expenses are more than less than likely to be transparent about their finances. So building that donor trust is crucial to your organization. And I'm going to give you a couple of ideas about how you can do that. Um, so for sure. And uh, why another reason of why all of this is important is because a nonprofit and maybe you've heard this before, or maybe this is new to you, but it really should run like a business. When we talk about sustainability, uh, 
the compliance parts, it's, it's, it's is a very business aspect, right? Articles of incorporation, annual reports with the state, filing for your taxes, all of that are, are things that for-profit businesses do. And then in the nonprofit side, we also have things like charity registrations, right? Instead of the 1120 for the for-profit, you're going to file the 990 every year. And that happens no matter what kind of revenue you bring in. There's a common misconception that, well, I didn't bring any money, I don't have to file, and that's just not true. Uh, the IRS will talk about the penalties there, but they can revoke your status if you're not telling them what's happening. So your organization, no matter what model, what structure, what mission you possess, uh, you should be running it like a business and you're gonna legally operate if you understand a lot of the things that I'm sharing with you here, right? So charitable solicitation, we'll go more in depth about that, but that's your license really to solicit in the state. Uh, we talked about the IRS 990, the annual report with the state, which keeps your name and everything updated uh, with your board and the people who are in charge of the organization. Um, and the more you realize why all of this important is because a public charity, right, a 501c3 is not owned by anyone but the public. It's a public charity because it's owned by the community that you're serving. So if we talk about, uh, you know, for-profit business might have stockholders, right, who have invested money and bought a seat at the table. The people who bought a seat at the table in the nonprofit is really the public. They're the ones giving you funds to run your project and your mission. Uh, so you owe it to them. To, to be transparent um, in, your, in your compliance and your fundraising. So I wanted to really elaborate on what that means for your donors. We talked about a little bit about donor trust and that transparency. So what is it about bookkeeping that is so appealing to honors? In a book by Lynn Wester, the four pillars of donor relations are acknowledgement, stewardship and reporting, recognition and engagement. And there's way is that reporting to donors can really hit those four pillars that you're doing. Not only is bookkeeping a mandatory tool for any successful business, because it helps the organization stay true to their budget and maximize those donations as a well-run organization, but bookkeeping allows you to know where your expenses are going, right? You're going to need to categorize every single thing that you're spending. You're going to categorize donations and income as well. And you're going to be able to know the economic health of the organization. And I think a lot of the mistakes I see from small and large organization is that they have all this wonderful information in-house, but they haven't shared it with the people who gave them the money. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about, about how you can do that and how you engage your donors. The same way you budget for your family's grass, groceries, or transportation is the same way that you should budget for your organization. Um, I love using my client stories because when we get people with these new ideas, uh, you know, I, I had a client who wanted to open and feed the homeless and she wanted to open a food truck and um, she's been doing this. And I asked her, well, what's your cost per meal? And she didn't really know how to answer that. I broke that down a little further. Well, you told me you had your first event. How much did you spend on supplies? How much did you spend on groceries? And we were able to work our way backwards with, um, a cost per head, you know, and knowing that if you were going to ask someone for money, hey, I want you to donate $25 a month because that's going to help me feed a family of four with my meals is so much better than just give me $25. So bookkeeping can help you build that trust and tell your donor exactly where it's going. Um, and it's the key to success for, for running an organization. Some ways that you can do this by are by making sure that your 990s, which we'll talk about, I promise. So those tax returns that you file, make sure they're posted with GuideStar and on your website. So that same drop down when you have our team about us, our mission, you can put a special section that says finances or or impact or financial impact and, and post them. Be thorough. Someone, the donors might not ever click it, but they see that you have it posted up there so they know that you're building transparency with them. Fi reporting financial goals met and not met. I wanted to put in this here because QGIVE is a great partner. I wish I had known about QGIVE when I ran my organization. The importance of a thermometer for a campaign or a gala event or a silent auction is so important, right? We've seen when 
we're getting close to to that goal, how all of a sudden things start pouring in because people want to be helped be a part of accomplishing that goal. And even when they're not met, you know, you should really be transparent about what's needed and thank them for what you can do with what was raised. Um, QGIVE is a great platform for, for those fundraising tools that you're gonna need to make your event successful. We have creating impact reports. You know, this is something that we've started doing here in Bright Ridge as a part of our development program, using all of that data that you have, right? You know your budget, you know your expenses, and putting it in a visual way that the donor, the everyday donor can understand. So an impact report is not number heavy, but it defines the special and crucial moments that you had the last year. Um, it's funny because we did an impact report for a client and I was asked, well, what do I do with this now? Yeah, it's pretty. The branding is beautiful. But what do I do with this? And I was like, show it. Thank the donors who gave you throughout the year. Email them. Put them in your newsletter. Post it in your financial website so someone can come back. The impact report, you know, will have thanks to your $100,000 donations last year, we were able to feed, feed these amount of families and um, send these amount of kids to school and you know this is where you take back last year's accomplishments and you put it in a visual way that you can use for your marketing and social media um, according to GuideStar if GuideStar is a new word for you which I'm sure it's not if you're in the nonprofit sector uh, they you know their research recently um, reveals that transparent nonprofits received more contributions and were stronger organization so that idea that bookkeeping makes stronger organization goes back to the fact that donors can tell if you have this information you must have good infrastructure in place like a business to get this information to keep it updated to know that your money is going to the right places and as a donor that's really all that i want and this is why I wanted to give you a little scenario of things that I that I that I, that we kind of do here at Brightbridge when you purchase uh, something from us, whether it's in the grant fundraising sector or even as you're establishing your nonprofit. We have a lot of clients who, you know, I'm going to open a nonprofit and money's going to come rain down on me. Um, I wish I could see your little hands and be like, how many of you guys have heard that before? And I always like to do this perspective. If you were giving away $100,000, which organization would you choose? And then I try to paint them a picture of organization A, organization B, and then they're like, okay, you're right, we're not there yet. And that's when I tell them this whole idea of you're gonna crawl, walk, run. And I wanna show you guys uh, a little scenario. And this is a little different than the picture I paint, but I wanted you guys to see some 990s because I told you um, as a, pay tax preparer, this is kind of what I what I see a lot. Um, I, by the way, 990s are public records. So I did black them out because I just don't want to put any nonprofit on the spot. But um, any nonprofit, if you ask them for the 990s, they're legally, um, they should legally give it to you. And the IRS posts all of them. Um, and we'll talk about and I'll show you where later on. But for example, with the with the 990, um, what I wanted you to, to notice is that this 990 in particular is over 50 pages, okay? Um, we talk, we're going to talk a little bit about the different uh, 990s that an organization can file, because obviously you can't expect an organization who brings less money to maybe do a 50-page return for very little movement. Um, but you can tell a lot about this tax return. Um, this is actually a very established organization. Um, they bring over $40 million. So right here, you can see their total revenue for the last year and for this current year. And their expenses are actually uh, about 30 million. So they had pretty good amount left over to either put in, they can reinvest it back in the organization, um, save it for a rainy day or a global pandemic. Um, but what I really, uh, you know, wanted you all to notice also, this one is fairly reliant on, um, on salaries. Um, so that's, you might want to question why close to half of it is going to salaries. We know that payroll is one of the most expensive things that a business can have. Uh, and then I digged a little deeper. I wanted to understand why. And this might be a little hard to see, but one of the first things I tell people is you do not pay your board of directors. And I love that here that all of their board, they get no compensation. And then uh, you do have to list the five 
the top five highest paid employees and the highest paid employee is 241,000. And that's not bad for a 40 plus million dollar revenue. So this tells me that this com this or nonprofit creates a lot of jobs. Uh, this nonprofit is actually someone that runs a, a so, sort of to a humane society, so animal shelters. So that's why their staff is heavy, right? They need to, someone to run all those centers um, and and help the animals, right? Uh, the dogs or the pets. So, but I would I would trust this organization. They're really well established. I can see that their CEO, the highest paid, you know, two hundred forty one is obviously higher than maybe the average, but they're running a forty million dollar. Right, it's it's all about that percentage. I think it ends up being like 0.05% of of the of the revenue and the expenses, and um, and th this is something that I would look at now as an educated donor. Um, obviously, the normal person might not, but someone your grant funder might look at this. They're gonna ask for ratios of your staff payroll, your rent, and some of them don't even wanna use the money for overhead expenses. So using 990s to make that decision can, can really go a long way, whether it's funding or donors, or major donors, right, major gifts. The next one isn't actually bad. Um, so this could depend on what kind of donor you are approaching and with what kind of idea uh, but they're very much in the startup stage okay giving them a hundred thousand dollars is seventy thousand dollars more than they have at the moment and uh and the one thing the percentage here close to 43 percent went to salaries so a startup you know you might be paying a couple of people a little stipend or whatever it is to kind of get the foundation, the, not, the organization going. But I think that's a little bit too high. Um, and this is not an organization that's heavy on, um, on shelters. So the mission also uh, has to do a lot with what those ranges should be, right? Um, if you didn't know the IRS, uh, if you're gonna pay somebody, it has to be at market value or less and in your area. So something good to know if you want to know how much you should pay is you can just quickly Google what the salary is for this title in your area. And if the IRS ever audits you or questions you, you're going to need to, you're going to, need to have backup about why you're paying them that amount. Um, this is the 990 easy. So it looks a little different than the full 990. This return is about 20 to 30 pages, not 50. And um, so you don't get to see as much. You do get to see the, the salaries. Um, so what, when I went into there, I was like, okay, well, who are they paying half of the revenue of the organization? Um, not the board, so good. <laughs> and they don't have any employees. So I think what ended up happening in this one is that they had some contractors, right? So maybe because they're building, putting up the website or um, maybe they do have to contract some therapists because they don't have any in-house yet. Uh, if this was, you know, an, an organization working with people with disabilities. So um, I thought that was just really interesting. And if you asked me $100,000 is a lot of money, I probably will give it to the organization um, who has a lot, unless this smaller organization can make a case that they would be ready to use that money and implement it right away. Um, but if there's anything you wrap from this too, is looking at the board should be a volunteer board. The board of directors should be people that give money to the organization and not get paid out, okay? Uh, next, I wanted to talk a little bit about federal compliance and fundraising. We talked, I mentioned maybe things that you know about or you don't, uh, but things to know. So 990s, 990s are those federal tax returns for nonprofits. I already told you that you they legally need to give it to you or provide it to you and they are public record. The IRS can also release them if they haven't posted them on the site. We have five types that I'm gonna talk about. The 990N, the 990Z and the 990. PF and the 990 team. The 990N are for organizations, not for not private foundations, regular 501c3s who make under $50,000 a year. With guess what, the exception of four states because you need to use the 990s to report to your state with your charity registration renewal. So we'll talk about that a little bit. The 990N 
$150,000. It really, it's called the postcard too. You might've heard that. Um, if you don't have your bookkeeping in place, but you know, you made less than 50,000, I would suggest use it and start getting your bookkeeping in place. Okay. Cause I know paying an accountant is a lot of money. Um, but you, if you ever want to apply to grants, you'll need to graduate from the 990N, okay? You need to be transparent. And funders will ask you for either audited financial statements from an accountant or this 990 easy or 990 full that you submitted to the IRS. The 990 easy can be used for anybody who makes under $200,000 um, and has less than $500,000 in assets, I believe. And uh, it's not a 50 page return, but it is about a 20, 30 where you need to disclose like who you're paying and where your money's going. And you know, you do need to have an itemized list of your uh, revenue and your expenses. The full form 990, which we saw an example of both of them is can be a 50 plus page return. Um, and uh, you know, this is most common for 200,000 who bring in more than $200,000 in revenue um, organizations. Uh, and it's got a lot of really different things that as a funder, I would like to see. So if I ever decide to give all my money away, I think this is one of the key forms that I would require from organizations. Um, the 990 PF, if you're a private foundation, you automatically have to do the private foundation. And then the 990T, it's unrelated business income. Um, so if you uh, have any sort of business transactions uh, on sort of the for-profit side, you'll need to you'll need to file this. It's it's very less common that that we see here at Brightbridge. Uh, do no later than the fifteenth day of the fifth month after the fiscal year. The most common is December to May fifteenth. If you're an organization that works with schools, so like after school programs, or maybe you just kind of work in that school calendar, then your fiscal year probably ends in June. 31st. So that would be due November 15th. Failure to file your form 990. Any of them can result in severe penalties. The IRS charges $20 a day for after the due date for every day that you're late. And uh, if you don't submit it for three years, they don't have to be consecutives. If you forget to skip a year and then you forget, to, and then later on you forget to do two, they can result um, in your organization being revoked. And revoked is forever. You, even if you get reinstated and in good standing, you'll always be marked as an organization that got revoked um, previously. Federal compliance and fundraising. We're talking about um, those 990s again. So looking at payroll, making sure that you're checking the percentages. Again, some missions might have a little bit about, uh, they might be more personnel heavy. We talk about how much therapists should, should be getting paid for the services that they're doing for children and, um, you know, versus maybe an organization that's more volunteer ran or doesn't need to be that uh, personnel heavy. So looking at payroll, uh, how much of it goes to contractors as well, because that might not be an efficient way to run it. Uh, something that I like to think is just like any business, your business shouldn't be more than 30% payroll, right? The rest could be rent, marketing, profits, things like that. Um, for organization, it really shouldn't be more than 10 Again, there are organizations that are more personnel heavy, but if you if you say 10, if I give you a dollar, 90, 90 cents of that is going back to the programs, 10 cents is going to the people who make the programs happen. So that's a little bit better than saying, hey, 90 cents on a dollar, right? 90% of our expenses go to pay people and only 10 will actually go to the programs that we offer. So I'll be looking at all of those percentages as a donor or a funder. And then the public support test. So depending on how you're set up with the or with the IRS, uh, the public support test looks at if you're making too much money from one single donor, because that can make you a private foundation. Um, or uh, if you didn't set it up correctly, or maybe you did, this is to kind of help catch maybe those money laundering organizations who are using you know, a single source and calling themselves a nonprofit. Um, 
at least 33% has to come from a public support system. So your donations and contributions and no more than 33% can come from a single source. So they're going to monitor that and they do that with schedule A. So there's a couple schedules, which I'm going to show you. They have different functions within the IRS tax system. Um, and schedule A represents, the, there's gonna be a place where they ask you to, to talk about that 33%, but also schedule A helps you to see how the organization has progressed over time. So it's you need to show financials for the last five years and they should match the previous tax returns. And, uh, you know, they'll ask you about total support. And at the end of this page, I'm sorry, I cut it off. Um, there'll be a chance, where it'll ask you to calculate how much was from the public versus investments versus a single person. Um, and then as long as you keep that 33% over, you can continue to function as a 501c3 public charity. All right, we're halfway through. So federal compliance, again, we're looking at another scenario and I wanted you guys to see how, if I asked you that same question, uh, one of the takeaways from here is how you would go and look at this information. Um, and I'm not sure if everybody knows it's out there, but it's out there. The IRS tags exempt organization search. This is where all the public records live for determination letters. So if someone says, hey, I'm a nonprofit, this is also where you can go and validate that. There's state, there are state websites to do this, but I always like to start from here and then kind of work my way backwards because this is what makes an organization tax exempt. And you'll be able to see their determination letter. It'll explain to you when they got it. Uh, it'll explain to you if they have required to file 990s and different things like that. You can see um, it'll ask you for EIN or by name. You can narrow it down by state. Uh, the most accurate is really the EIN number. So that employer identification number that every organization has. Sort of like a social security for, for you, a EIN is a number assigned to that, that business. You would search it here and you would find a record of all the 990s and file with the IRS if they've been revoked, which is my favorite. And again, you you might not make that assumption. You know, some people just didn't have the right board of directors keeping track of the compliance, but I wouldn't want my money to go to an organization that doesn't have these internal processes in place where they're not checking where their money is going, where they're not updating the IRS, when they're not in good standing or it's happened before. So as a funder and as a major donor, I would definitely look at these things before choosing what organization to support. All right state compliance and fundraising. So you would think, oh my God, I just dealt with the IRS. Now I have to do something with the state. The state has their own local laws and that's just the reality of it. And sometimes they tend to either contradict, contradict federal or they're just not in sync with each other, but you have to do it, right? So even though the IRS gave you, you know, um, exemption to be tax exempt, the state's going to be like, well, you haven't registered with us so i'm not giving you the state local tax exemption so this is sort of where that charity registration comes in and there's a lot of functions to the charity registration they require it so that they are aware that you're going to be soliciting in their state that if someone complains to the state for failure to use the donations the way they were promised to and someone can complain they can hold you accountable because you're registering it, you're telling them, hey, I wanna solicit in the state and I'm gonna use these funds for this specific purpose. And if someone you know, catches you or not you, but a nonprofit doing something different than what the funds were intended to, like paying themselves for their vacation in Aruba, um, they can make an official complaint and there will be a case opened for you. And you could probably get your IRS also, uh, your, your tax exemption revoked. Um, there is a lot of people, a lot of clients that come my way that are not aware of the charity registration. Um, when we get asked the question, well, I opened a 501c3, when can I start soliciting? The IRS is going to backdate to your articles of incorporation. The articles of incorporation are your birth certificate. The IRS will backdate it to that if you do the application correct. But to solicit in the state, you will need to register first. And some organizations grant it. 
at the time the IRS gives it to you. So you can technically start soliciting at the time. If an organization has a charity registration that's required, you'll need to do that charity registration first. And what's tricky here is that some states let you submit it with a pending submission or application. Some organizations are like, no, sorry, you have to wait until you get your letter to start soliciting. So this puts you in a period of limbo until the IRS answers you. The professional um, solicitors is a part of that charity registration. But if you are a professional solicitor, you're calling on behalf of an organization and you're getting paid to solicit, uh, some states might have this license uh, requirement. And what's interesting that I, that I found about professional solicitors is that every state has very different um, definitions. Some it's strictly people who call on behalf and fundraise. We know that fundraising doesn't just happen over the phone. So uh, some of these things might still be outdated on the state level, but just be very careful when you're paying someone to fundraise for you. Uh, ask about if they have uh, a license with the state, check with the state if they do need a license. Um, and when we talk about uh, uh, a lot of this, uh, the solicitation, for example, if you are doing a campaign where you want to reach out to all 50 states, you might want to consider what's called a national charity registration. Uh, because if uh, you operate in Florida, you have everything in Florida, but all of a sudden you're doing an event in New York because you also have connections there and you're soliciting without their, their charity registration, you could get fined by the state of New York. So it's not like one state and shares it all. You'll need to do it in each state that you're fundraising. And finally, we have gaming license. So that usually refers to bingos, raffles, games of chance. So things that you might see a lot in galas, uh, walks where you give out raffle tickets. And each, what I also found is that each state has very different set of rules. And there are actually two states that don't even allow any of this as a nonprofit. So it was Hawaii and Utah. So I thought that was really interesting. Um, so uh, they'll, they'll have a, some states will require you to have a license for every time you host an event, such as which will have a raffle or a bingo. Others will require that you renew it every year, uh, as long as you're specific about what those kind of events are gonna be used for. Uh, if you don't have the correct license, someone could just ultimately snitch on you and you could lose and get penalties. Uh, and again, your organization, this is all about uh, that organ, that nonprofit report and um, transparency. All right, we're almost there. So just things to remember, you know, many states have their own versions of their 4990 that gets attached to the charity registration. Um, some also have fancy names for extra state tax exemptions, such as the Franchise Tax Board. I'm looking at you, California. Um, and state local tax might come from a different form than the chair registration. Some have it all inclusive in there. Um, but regardless of it, you're gonna need to attach some kind of financials to this. Uh, I think it's become more practice that if you do file an N90N, they might allow you to fill out their own statements, but they might ask for audited financial statements. So no matter how much you bring in, bookkeeping is extremely important to you. If you made one, don't if you brought in one donation and you spend one thing, categorize it, bookkeep it, call it a day. Um, um, you again. Anything you prepare to the IRS, you probably have to submit something to the state level. Um, and if you don't prepare it, you could get fined, shut down, administratively dissolved, which is one of my favorite words. If you don't submit your annual reports, which is not a part of the charity solicitation or fundraising, but that's where you keep your name open and active, they will administratively dissolve you. And uh, you know, right now, 42 of the states currently require charity registration. So I would say more often than not, you have to do it. And then just a small recap of everything that we've kind of talked about. Uh, compliance and fundraising have a lot of things in common, right? We talked about donor trust and that transparency, how it could increase your the chance of getting a funding opportunity, how it'll help your organization look better when writing your grants, because not only are you backing it up with your passion, but you're backing 
backing it up with numbers, right? If you look at funders, they're investors of your dream and your mission. So you want to make sure you have that. And then maintaining status. Easy as that. If you don't do your compliance, um, you'll lose status and you could lose and jeopardize your tax exempt 501c3 determination and donors will not want to donate to you if they can't write it off. Um, and I think... Uh, this is just something so important as fundraiser, whether you're a professional fundraiser and you already know about your licenses, sometimes it's hard to even explain to you the importance of your role to organizations. Organizations might be hard to explain why to the board or for startups, why we need to invest in someone who's actively making sure that we're in good compliance, right? Um, this is really just a good way to, to justify that. If you're not in good standing, if you're not a strong organization with strong procedures, processes, and a strong funding source, you are less than likely to get funding from either donors or major donors. And finally, so it's just some takeaways and a little thing that we at Bright Bridge want to do for you all. So if there's anything that you do at the end of this PowerPoint or presentation or webinar, I want you to visit the IRS search tool and uh, I'm sure we'll give you a link in the after in the in the email that Kim is going to send after. And I want you to look at your organization and see what's posted. What's really funny is that the IRS has been so behind that they're. I swear, sometimes they run as a nonprofit. They're probably understaffed. Um, they have been doing their best to update determination letters, but the pandemic when their offices were closed for about three months. So any returns from last year that we paper filed are still being processed. So look up to see what has been posted and what hasn't. Uh, I don't advise you to call the IRS just yet. You can definitely call us for your help, but look at what your organization looks like in the IRS search tool. And then we have a brand new map on our website that I'm going to give you access to where you can see what your state compliance looks like. That state has a chair registration, yes, no. Does it have a sales tax exemption? Yes, no. You can look at the, you can search yourself if there's a link to do a charity search because you can also look at the state charity search to see if someone has applied for a solicitation license. And I want to give everybody here a free complimentary compliance review, anybody that's registered, the chance for someone from our team to look at what your nonprofit looks like um, and give you just sort of where you are, where you've been, and what you might need. And I hope this has been super helpful. Um, I'm going to give the power now to Kim. All righty. Well, I think I stopped sharing. We're good, right? <laughs> <laughs> I think you did too. Um, well, thank you. Gosh, that Andrea, that's so much. I, I, I didn't even know any of that. Um, I do want to just address, uh, we have some several questions. Um, in our uh, follow-up email with the presentation that will have the links to the resources that Andrea just referenced, we also have the link to the landing page where you can register for that complimentary review. Um, so we do have a couple questions for you. Let's see how you're doing. Uh, Tanya asked, can you change your charity status to other 501 statuses? Yeah, so I hope I'm going to try to answer this two ways. So if I'm thinking about 501c statuses, so you have the 501c3, 501c4, 6, 7, 8, there's a bunch, right? They all define something different that your organization's doing it. Um, if you're talking about changing those codes, you can. For example, 501c4 is uh, it's it's called a social welfare organization. The most common way to use it is if you want to lobby, okay? Because you know 501c3s they shouldn't be lobbying more than 10% of their funds or time. So if you want to be an organization that's fully like we want to change uh, legislation and influence it, then you probably want to be a 501c4. Yes, you can do that. The sad story is that there's still a huge fee that's almost the same as if you really just start it correctly. From private to public and public to private, which is still a 501c3, but they're categorized different, right? Because a private foundation could come from a family wealth. That can come from, it, it really should come a private foundation, even though it's a 501c3, from one source. Usually for-profit business try to open this to use their, their, their profits to give back. 
Um, you can change either or. The process looks a little different, but there's still a form and a fee that you have to pay to the IRS to what's called reclassification. All right, that was a good answer. Um, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> Teresa has asked a couple questions actually. Um, the first is if they wanted to pay commission for donations, is that acceptable? And then the second part of this was, or would those people need a solicitor license? That's a great question. So there's a couple of ways I've seen this in the state, and that's going to depend on your state laws. Uh, like I said, the IRS, because they don't want to put a lot of regulation to contradict state laws. Uh, if you do pay someone for fundraising, you would just have to validate that what they're paying is at market value or less, right? So that's why I advise against a percentage because people can say that's not the right way to, to calculate that, you know? Um, but you can have a flat fee as, as a paid contractor and things like that. And they, they should have a license if they're gonna get paid for their fundraising. Um, as far as state laws, the license, anybody who's a professional solicitor would know what the, that particular state that you're operating um, requires of them. Um, always good for you to ask, uh, and like I said, you can pay always, always uh, when when doing something like this for under a nonprofit, you just want to make sure that you're paying someone fair, um, not more than other, not because you want to pay your, your son a salary and they're going to try to fundraise and you're going to give them something ridiculous. So those laws are really in place to protect the nonprofit sector and the public's funds. Um, so uh I hope that answers it. Um, if not, uh, if that doesn't answer your question, uh, Teresa, uh, the contact information Email us to reach sure. out to Andrea is, is definitely there. Um, Seema has, uh, when do we need a 990T? Uh, that's a great question, and I would love to maybe send out more information that I've, I myself only prepare anything up to the full 990. We have some staff who does prepare the 990T. In two years I've been here, we've only had one order, so I would say it's more rare than other. Um, it's unrelated business tax income, so I would assume um, th there's, there's profits that you can make that relates to your mission. Right, you've seen these kind of be set up as goodwill is a perfect one. They help give, you know, they have a for-profit business if you think about how they make their donations. Um, but they uh, they can back it up with the fact that the people working in goodwill are either disabilities, veterans, part of that charitable class. So unrelated business tax is really that is you're doing something that's totally unrelated with the public funds then you'll need to kind of, um, and what the IRS really just wants to see because you're a nonprofit doesn't mean you don't make profit. It just means the profit you do make has to go back to the organization. So uh, you'll, you'll pretty much know when you have to file an N90T. And if you don't, you can certainly contact me and I can look into your organization. All right. Uh, another question is board members, are they allowed to be salaried members of an organization? Oh, I love this question. <laughs> Why? Because I have a perfect example. So actually some states, uh, and maybe one day I'll memorize the states, but some states, it's illegal to have a paid board. They require that all board members be what's called volunteer board members. And that's because the board should not be doing the everyday today activities like staff or or, or your employees do. The board is there to make decisions about the salaries. They decide what the executive director gets paid. They can fire and hire the executive director. So they're overseeing the overall health of the organization and wealth. But I will give you my most perfect example. Uh, especially for startups, we have organizations who the president is the executive director and that gets a little, you know, your goal is to, release that power. I'm sorry to tell you, I know it's your baby, but your goal is to have powerful people who are going to help you build that organization and you will eventually just do the every day to day activities. But for the time being, that president, founder, executive director, they can get paid, but they can only get paid for their responsibilities and roles as the executive director. They do not get paid for their roles and responsibilities as president. The most perfect example 
I am a doctor who works with Doctors Without Borders and I serve on their board. I also happen to be the top doctor in cleft palate surgeries that people do abroad, right? I cannot get paid for my role on the board, but if I do surgeries for the organization, I could get paid for the surgeries that I did for the kids. So again, if you differentiate the roles, you can, but the majority of the pay people should not be on the board and some states will, will argue that with you. So as long as you, you're clear that the people on the board, president, secretary, treasurer, have their roles and responsibilities and their volunteer board. And my favorite thing to tell my clients is honestly, they should be paying to sit on the board. I had a very small organization that I ran, but I made them pay $100 a year. Organi big organizations, you have to pay $30,000 to sit on the board. Look at what the org, or, or you have to be responsible for making sure you're bringing about 30,000. If it doesn't, you want it out of your pocket, make sure you ask all your friends to buy gala tickets and they can help pay your fee to sit on the board. But I love to tell them that I had a small organization. I obviously couldn't charge 30,000 to sit on my board, but I did want their investment and commitment to sit on my board. So I said, Hey, our, our board dues are a hundred dollars a year. And I think it gave them a little, you know, it gave them a little bit of that responsibility and, and stuff. I hope that. All right. the question. Well, thank you. You do have a couple more questions in our time left. Sam has asked if the term of the organization is every two years and the officer and address and, and address change every two years, should the information be sent to state and IRS about it? And is there a cost associated with it? Yeah, that's a great question. So you can, there are, Sometimes in changes, there are people like, take my name right away. I don't want to, I want you to take away my name right away. We have to make the change right away. If you are in that predicament, you can file what's called an amendment or you can submit the forms uh, just kind of as an update. But every year you have to renew these forms. So I'm wondering if your organization has renewed them. And maybe you're in California. California is biennial for the, for the, for the statement of information. Every state also, by the way, has very different names for these forms. So don't be discouraged if you can't find it. Uh, they're biannual, but that's the chance where you could update a lot of this information um, in your annual reports, in your charity registration renewal, um, in your, you know, sales tax exemption renewal if they require it, or uh, many of these uh state department offices, you can also just call them and ask them to update. It just depends on the, um, on what the function of the form or contact information is. There is a cost associated to it. It's actually, it's not a lot. Uh, they do it sometimes depends on the revenue. So that's why they ask for the revenue. Depending on the revenue the organization brings, that depends the fee that you pay to the state. All right. Um, thank you. Uh, Jenny is asking, what is the percentage um, revenue versus fundraising in a healthy nonprofit? Oh my God, you hit me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, so we, I, I gave some percentages. So I'm not sure if I understand the question because technically everything, see fundraising is broken up into individual contributions, grants, Fundraising is all of the revenue, really. You can have program. Maybe you're asking against program service revenue and investments. And this might be a better opportunity if Jenny is going to sign up for her individual review, so that you could look at her. Yeah, facts. yeah. I see we're it, it put you on yeah, the spot I, a bit. <laughs> I think you know. And what's funny is that um, uh, technically, to me, all of the revenue is fundraising, right? Whether it's individual contributions, grants, and everything. But if we're we're talking about maybe there's a structure there where there's program service revenue like uh you 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 don't give meals out for free but you charge a dollar to make sure that they eat it and not throw it away you know so um or, or you can sometimes see in like low low health like low cost healthcare kind of nonprofit organizations where they do charge a small fee um so i would be so interested to know and i'll definitely look at that up for you and if you contact me, I'll get you the answer. Um, we have a, another question actually from Sam. Should an organization that is less than 50,000 revenue need to have an attorney retainer or CPA? Is it recommended? Hi, yeah. Um, 
The answer is always yes. At least someone who knows finance should serve on your board and should be overseeing it. An accountant and a lawyer, $50,000 under organizations can't afford that. <laughs> um, there, we provide bookkeeping service at a much affordable price uh, and where we can guide you through. Uh, I would say the most important thing that you can do as a nonprofit leader is one, we've seen where organizations mix their stuff with their personal expenses. So make sure you have a, an account separate from that. And then in terms of bookkeeping, like I said, that just depends on the amount of transactions you do a month, right? Everything depends on how much volume the organization does. Uh, under 50,000, you probably don't do that much movement, right? So, uh, excuse me. QGIV itself, if you sign up for them as their, you know, um, to collect your donations to your website, you know, you can gather the report of how many donations you got in the year. So boom, you got your revenue. Um, and then your expenses is just something that you, I don't think you have to keep receipts, but if you yourself keep a spreadsheet, uh, and, uh, again, it, it's depending on the volume. If you only have five expenses a month and you can keep track of that. And then at the end, you know, kind of turn that over to, to someone like us where we can help decode it, then yes. But if you make a lot of movements and a bookkeeper and an accountant and someone who can um, do your, your balance sheet and profit and loss statement is ideal. All right. I think this is our last question. And I talk it, a lot. I know. <laughs> no, no, no. We've had, we've covered a lot. Um, what if my organization has never applied to a charity registration? Yeah, that's a great question because believe it or not, we have a lot of clients who didn't know that existed. And I think because the IRS doesn't require it, they give you your letter and their letter doesn't even say check with the state to see what else you have to do now. They really just don't communicate with each other, right? So yay taxpayer dollars at work. Um, but uh, that depends on the state. Some will ask you to file them for every year they you didn't file it with them son will be like okay just register now and go forward um the laws you know are clear but i also want to emphasize that these these charity registrations were also just kind of set up to hold you you know liable and responsible for the operations so unless someone has snitched on you you know the the, the state will probably be just be like just just get it in, you know, just give us all the forms back, we'll backdate it and, and we'll get you in there. As long as you've been um, functioning ethically, then the, 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 the sector's pretty, uh, the sector, the nonprofit sector itself, when it comes to compliance can be very forgiving um, because as long as you can prove that you've been acting in good conscience. I think I can sneak one last short question in and I'm not even gonna try to say your name, Ravi Shankar. Um, similar to IRS search page, do the states, the individual states have pages like that? Yes, uh, not all of them though. So before <laughs> I get too excited, most states, especially, I wanna be honest, uh, Obviously the pandemic has hit people very difficult, but it really moved the state departments to move some things online. So <laughs> uh, the pandemic, uh, like just a lot of things now because they were closed, their offices were closed. They, everything was paper. Now they can, now they have to do things virtually. So I think it prompted them to get these charity searches up and running and have their charity renewals uh, virtual, you know, so Yes, a lot of them do. If you look at our map, which we're going to send the link out where it says the interactive map, you can click on your state and we'll show you uh, where you can go to search it. Um, there's not a lot, uh, but for the most part, those, those, the big ones, California, can you imagine that it's the big states that have most of these things in place? California has like five forms that you have to do after you get 501c3. So um but all these states have had to, because they have such high volume, they've had to do it and move move to a place where you can look all this up. And New York, Florida, California, they have a, if you also Google like search a charity, check a charity for that state, it'll come up, but we have it on our interactive map now. 
Okay, well, we're just coming to the end and there are a handful of other questions. I'm sorry if we weren't able to get to those for you today, um, but I do encourage everyone to look for their email uh, with the link uh, to all of these resources, the link to get your free assessment, all of these um, webpage uh, spots that uh, Andrea has been referencing. So Andrea, thank you again so much. And thank you everyone for joining us. Um, we will be emailing out uh, hopefully tomorrow. Um, if you do have questions and would like to reach out to the QGIVE or Brightbridge team, please take note of the contact information here on, on this last slide. Uh, please do take the survey when prompted. It really does help us. And we hope that the information we covered um, really helps you better understand this integral relationship between compliance and, and fundraising. So thanks again, and we will be in touch. Bye. You have a great day.